I'm Mike Asinald and welcome to the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge's AC23 Plus Artist Legacy Series podcast. This is a series where we talk to artists who are doing amazing things in the areas of the arts, including performance, education, production, as well as arts advocacy. We record this series in the Virginia and John Nolan Black Box Studio, as well as in the Jan and Bill Grimes Recording Studio here at the Cary Siraj Community Arts Center. Be sure to visit artsbr.org for more information on all the great things we are doing here at the Arts Council of Greater Baton Rouge. Hope you enjoy the podcast series and thanks for tuning in. Sweetest one, me oh my yo. Oh. Well, son of a gun, we gonna have big fun on the bio. Well, jumbo lap, crawfish pie, a filet combo. Cause tonight I'm a gonna go see my share of me oh. We gonna pick tar in a fill fruit jar and go. Oh. Well, son of a gun, we gonna have big fun on the bio. I, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, um, I'd like to welcome our listeners and viewers to another episode of AC23 Plus Artist Legacy Series put on by uh, the Arts Council here of Greater Baton Rouge. And today is a, it's going to be a lot of fun for me because I've invited a guy I've known for quite a while now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the first time we met, but it's got to be over 25 years. Oh, yeah. Probably around 94 or something, I'm guessing. That sounds about 94, right. 94, 95? Yeah. Um, Dr. Chris Bellow. And thanks for being here, Chris. Thanks for having me. And um, there's a lot of things I, I'm looking forward to talking about. Um, what's going to make this so much fun, too, is uh, Chris is such a versatile musician. And uh, actually, when I think back on it, maybe one of the first ways we met was I needed a harmonica player for a film. I want to say it was a documentary I was doing, and uh, a mutual friend, I think I'm right on this, uh, Jeff Ford, right. said you should call Chris Bell on that. I want to say how that's, where we, that's where we first met. That sounds right. You were doing a lot of films and commercials and all kinds yes. of cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, back when that was an industry. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Before it all became canned music. Mm -hmm. um, well, so part of this legacy mm -hmm. series is to, you know, invite musicians and artists who ideally have a, a real connection to South Louisiana, more acutely Baton Rouge, uh, in New Orleans. And uh, you're certainly part of that. So tell me a little bit, Chris, about how you came up, where you came up, and how music kind of worked its way into your early life. Sure. So I was actually born in New Orleans, but I grew up in Baton Rouge. So I consider myself a Baton Rouge native. Um, but um, like a lot of us Baton Rouge music people, we're 
influenced by New Orleans and, and a lot of other things too, honestly. Sure. Um, but um, I, um, I grew up in, in this area, decided to get in the, in the band in the fifth grade. Okay. And um, so I had a couple of friends that were going to be in the band and they were telling me about it. And, um, and I picked the trombone because I had another friend that had already picked that instrument. I didn't even know what it was. I mm -hmm. just remembered that he told me that's what he was going to play. Right. So that's how I got started playing the trombone <laughs> and um, enjoyed it, but never really considered it uh, seriously, you know, through, yeah. through high school. But, you know, as, as I got older, I realized I, I really did enjoy band, right. you know. Right. And um, one of the more fulfilling things that I think I did in high school, uh, you know, as far as classes are concerned. But... Um, Sometime after high school, I started playing other instruments, mm -hmm. and uh, I was working in a bicycle shop, and uh, so I was I was uh, a bicycle repairman. You know, I was you know probably 16, 15, okay. something like that, and yeah. I, I like to ride bicycles, and I still do. But anyway, so one of the guys in the shop played guitar. You know. And he would play things like uh, country stuff and, you know, mm -hmm. Eagles tunes yeah. and, mm -hmm. and things like that. And I was like, man, that is so cool, you know. Yeah. And so he taught me a few things. And so in between fixing bikes, he showed me a chord, you know. And, <laughs> and so I started playing around with it and realizing that this is a lot of fun. And I picked up the harmonica along the way somewhere in that process and um, just... Um, realized that you know music was something that i really uh was inspired by and uh gave me a feeling of uh fulfillment and so forth did you have and, it in your family prior musicians in the family well indirectly um my uh my grandfather on my mother's side came from a musical family and all of his brothers and and that whole family uh was was they were all musicians mm -hmm. but this was not even in america this was in austria oh, okay. so my grandfather came to america before world war ii and um so yeah there is music in the family but i wasn't really directly exposed to it it Not just kind of passed family. through right. yeah. uh and um and i had taken some tests and things you know trying to figure out what to do and some of the test results said well you know you, you've got some musical talent you might want to consider doing some things that are music related right. and so putting all that together uh, at some point i just decided to kind of do something radical and, and uh, try to go to music school. And um, so I auditioned to uh, the LSU Music School, got in the LSU Music School, and, uh, and, and worked my way through it um, because I didn't really know much about uh, – I was a trombone major. I didn't really know much about the instrument other than what I learned in high school, so I had a lot to catch up on. Right. But, um, but it was enjoyable, and um, – and I also studied at Southern with Alvin Baptiste, Absolutely. who was, um, you know, as you know, because you studied with him too, he was an incredible uh, musician and teacher and, and person. Right. And right. so that was inspiring. So I had all these great music teachers in my life that kind of uh, really helped, uh, you know, foster that. And, um, and it just kind of came from there. You know, it's interesting when I think mm -hmm. about uh, education in general, especially mm -hmm. music education, mm -hmm. because it is such a uh, an oral language, and the different ways of teaching it. And one thing I discovered, kind of like you, uh, you know, there's more, there's a traditional way of learning, right? Which is, I'm guessing, which you primarily experience at LSU. You know, sure. starting with Larry Campbell and all those yeah. amazing teachers, and then you get a you get in the the orbit. Of Alvin Batiste, who was an incredibly accomplished musician, but his method of teaching, in my opinion, was very, you might say, old school, or just another way I would say it is just a very natural way of teaching. It's a very, the, very much in the oral, oral tradition where you, he plays something, you had to listen to it, learn it by ear, process it, and do it that way. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, all classes that I ever took, whether they were math or English or music, there was always a textbook or several textbooks. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you got the book and 
they tell you to read the book, and you're like, okay, all right, well, I'll read it when I get around to it or whatever. Right. But he didn't have a book. Right. <laughs> he would just break it down to like, okay, the first thing you need to know is the steps of music, mm. you know, and a half step is the smallest step. Two half steps is a whole step. The right. next is a minor third, a major third. And, and you know, he would simplify things like that. And it's, it's actually pretty complex mathematically in a sense. Sure. But the way he laid it out, it was very simple. Right. Uh, but he kept piling on more and more and more and started out very simple. It became incredibly complex. And, and, and so you found that you had a lot going on in your head. <laughs> That he Before was knew it, that he yeah. was laying on you, you know, <laughs> and then you know he would play something and you you play it back and you think, well, is that what? You, and he said, no, that's not it. And he'd play it back, mm -hmm. you know. So you have to really learn how to listen and break things down and you know listen to rhythms and and you, you just develop this appreciation for how how much there is in music. There's a lot there. I, I remember specifically one time working with him because we would just. Yeah, the, the funny story I, I think is you'd walk into the music building there and you'd walk past he would always be practicing mm -hmm. like he was at that time probably late 50s early 60s when I got to him and he just practiced all the time sure. you, you know and, I, and here I am like a 19 year old you know thinking I practice an hour I'm good and it's like this guy with the resume and the ability and the whole thing and he just practices nonstop. so th that was one wake up call but I remember being in a session with him one time, just uh, the two of us. We practiced a lot together, just the two of us. And uh, he would play something, and I would struggle to get it. And he said, no, 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 just like you said. And I said, well, can you slow it down? It's like, they're going to slow it down for you on the gig? <laughs> yeah, right. No. <laughs> Good So comeback, learning huh? how to yeah. process things quickly. Right, right. Uh, Professionalism. Prof yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He, he, yeah. Was, he was a gem. Oh, yeah, yeah. There will never be another Alvin Baptiste. No, Who could no. say that again? Um, yeah. Okay, well, so you, you had the, those unique experiences. Uh, so then what happens? So I played around town, different types of situations. Uh, and, of course, you know, having the, the background at LSU and Southern, uh, I really thought, you know, jazz was the coolest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't a whole lot of jazz out in the community Sure. Uh, that I could get paid to do. So I played whatever whatever I could get paid to do. And at some point, I decided, well, this is pretty hard. <laughs> 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 and I don't really know where this is going. Um, That's when you start writing a lot of blues songs. <laughs> some people don't really worry about that, right. but I did. And um, so I thought, well, you know, I'm still young enough. I could do a lot of other things, and I had interest in science and so forth. So, so anyway, I ended up moving to Shreveport and uh, decided I'm just going to put music aside for a little while and uh, finish up a degree in something. And um, so the putting music aside didn't last very long. You know, I met people that I had known from down here, and next thing you know, I'm playing gigs up there. And, um, and then also I... Um, Stayed in college. College was really cheap back then. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was crazy cheap compared to the way it is now. Well, today it's crazy. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I ended up getting um, two undergrad degrees, including uh, all of the prerequisites to go to medical school. And there was a medical school in Shreveport, LSU Medical School. And so I applied and got into medical school. And that's, that's where I stayed uh, until I finished med school, and then I came to New Orleans mm -hmm. and did residency. Uh, I played a lot in Shreveport, uh, a lot of different situations, jazz groups, uh, kind of rhythm and blues bands, uh, even some country groups, and a um, few recordings here and there. Met a lot of really cool people as a very um, deep music history in Shreveport that, you know, we don't really see down here. But, but talk, everybody thinks, uh, you know, especially New Orleans, Lafayette with the, um, the Cajun culture. And I honestly am not that familiar with the Shreveport history, musical history. So school me a little bit on that. Like what's, what's going well, on Well, um, a lot of people talk about uh, the Louisiana Hayride. Yeah. 
And um, I think they bring it up because there was a lot to it. They mm -hmm. had a lot of really great artists that would come on like once a week and they'd do a show. Mm -hmm. It was a live performance. Uh, and it was a radio show at the same time. Right. So a lot of the people that became stars started out on that uh, uh, location, and uh, including Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. So, you know... Elvis Presley got his start in Shreveport, Louisiana, at mm -hmm. the Louisiana Hayride. Yeah. I mean, that's a big deal. Right. Because that was like a whole new spin on, on music. World, you know? world music. Uh, yeah, the whole, the yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you go through Shreveport, you don't think about that. But that's, that's where a lot of that started. And, of course, great, great country artists up mm -hmm. there. And really some great blues and jazz artists right. up there, too. Right. So uh, rich musical tradition mm -hmm. in North Louisiana. Uh, so, you know, the state of Louisiana has a lot to offer from uh, the perspective of music, no question about it, Absolutely. throughout the entire state. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, we're talking so much about music. Uh, it makes me want to play some music. And you, <laughs> how do you like that seg? Um, <laughs> yeah, that was subtle. <laughs> um, so in addition to, you know, learning so much of the musical repertoire, regardless of genres, um, you also write music. I take a stab at it, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, and I, I met some other people that, that were, I considered good writers, tried to learn from them. And, uh, and it's fun. Yeah. It's kind of a cool thing. Well, we were talking about a tune. You were showing it to me. Um, um, well, you actually showed it to me a long time ago because we recorded it. But, yes. Uh, but as we were talking about uh, talking about it a minute ago, this will be sort of like the first non-record uh, performance of it, I guess live performance mm, of it. Right. Uh, yeah. So tell me about this tune. Okay. So um, we're talking about Swamp Fever, Swamp right? Fever, yeah. Okay. So this song was co-written by... A man named Billy Henderson. Billy lives in in Tennessee, okay. and um, I met Billy in a recording studio here in Baton Rouge. And um, <clears throat> he had written a lot of tunes through the years. Um, he had written some tunes with Jerry Reed, oh, wow. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was friends with the Everly Brothers, and mm -hmm. he just done, did a lot of interesting stuff, mostly in the Tennessee area. So um, he told me he wanted to do some stuff together. And one day I get an envelope in the mail, and it's full of, of sheets like, like this in his handwriting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's words. And he said, well, I write words. That's what I do. I write words. And you write the music. So, so that's what I did. I wrote, yeah. I took his words, okay, mm -hmm. and wrote some music to it, and we came up with it. And of course, applied a melody and so forth. Sure, came sure. up with this song, um, and uh, that's one way to do things, you yeah. know, with songwriting. It's kind of yeah. cool when you collaborate with somebody because you end up with something maybe a little different than what you originally start out thinking, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes it's. It's way better, you know. I agree. That's mm -hmm. that's always been fun for me. Just to, kind of the jockeying of ideas between two or three people. It's, yeah, this is fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, let's play it. Okay. It's all so bright up on that stage, but you lose count of the towns you've played, the lonesome miles fade away like fog down on the coast. Miss the levee, soaked full of rain, the rich fields of sugar cane. But those dark eyes in my dream, 
what I I miss the most Got that old swamp fever And it's burning up the road With this aching in my soul I gotta get back to Baton Rouge And find that girl from the bayou And let her kisses gently cool Cool down this swamp fever Got that old swamp fever And it's burning up the road Louisiana wide I leave her With this aching in my soul And I gotta get back down the Baton Rouge and find that girl down on the bayou and let her kisses gently cool cool down this swamp fever swamp fever and I play the bars and I sing my songs But this highway It is hard and long The rambling man Just rolls on Like smoke Through a screen door And I miss the cayenne the spice, the red beans, and the dirty rice, but those soft arms around the tide, that's what I'm really, I'm homesick for. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> well, you know how to write some music, I'll tell you that. <laughs>
<laughs> well, Billy wrote those words, man. Those Beautiful are, those words. Those are cool words. And tell me his name one more time. Billy Henderson. Billy Henderson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that his lyrics combined with that harmonic, melodic structure, killing. <laughs> killing, as they say. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I want to jump... Again, one of the reasons why this is uh, fun for me is I can we can go a lot of different spaces, and we've been talking a lot about music and um, your experiences in that realm. But yes, you are you are a medical doctor, and describe to me the kind of medical doctor you are, what you do, and uh, how that's a, you know I'd imagine a very big part of your life. Sure. So, my specialty is called physical medicine and rehabilitation. And um, so what we do, what I do, is I take care of people in a rehab hospital, and I also have an office. Mm -hmm. And in the office, I do things like uh, tests to check for nerve damage. You know, electromyography is the term yeah. that we use for that. And um, so we diagnose things like compression neuropathies at risk. That's called carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. Probably heard of that. Pinched nerves in necks and backs and so forth. And I give people shots in their necks and their backs for, uh, for disc herniations and, and nerve issues. And sometimes we burn nerves to reduce pain. Mm -hmm. And I give people shots. I do a lot of shots. <laughs> <laughs> I do shots for spasticity, which is a problem that some people have after brain damage okay. or spinal cord damage to loosen up their muscles so they can move around better. And um, so that's some of the things, some of the main things that, that we do. And uh, I really like my specialty. I'm, I'm lucky I found it. Mm -hmm. and that it all worked out for me uh and um and and i i've been here practicing physical medicine and re rehabilitation in baton rouge since 94 uh and i've worked uh at the bone and joint clinic mm -hmm. for a good while now and a bunch of great doctors there great place and also at a, at a rehab hospital, I've worked in at least three different rehab hospitals here in Baton Rouge. Okay. Currently, I'm at Sage Rehab Hospital. Been there a good while. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a good facility. We help a lot of people. Sometimes, um, you know, people going through some really rough stuff, you know, sure. really sure. difficult things. And uh, it's good to be able to help. Right. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned, I'm, I'm curious. Um, because one of the avenues I wanted to go down with you is just kind of get your thoughts on how music and the arts can benefit people's lives um, health-wise, you know. But before I even go there, I mean, you mentioned like carpal tunnels and sort of like these, um, as I understand it, r repetitive or things that happen as a result of a lot of repetitive motion type things. So my question sure. to you is, being a musician, right? do you come across a lot of musicians who are dealing with these kinds of things? Absolutely. I have musicians calling me all the time for medical problems. I'll confess I've called them too. <laughs> some of them are related to playing music yeah. and some aren't. But, um, but anyway, you know, music is, is kind of an interesting thing because it involves uh, movement and coordination and uh, it involves our brains and our peripheral nerves and muscles and so forth. And if you think about it, it's kind of like a highly specialized athletic activity, you know. We're not necessarily running up and down, uh, you know, fields and things like that, like, like football players, but we use our muscles, and they have to work the right way, and we have to train, you it's, know. It's funny. when I, I, I don't teach so much anymore, but for years I did, and I would always describe it kind of that way to, especially the pianist, but any musician, I would say, yeah, we're kind of like fine motor skill athletes. That's exactly right. There's yeah. no, no question about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, some musicians hit situations that end their careers, just, sure. just like, uh, you know, knee injuries for, for mm -hmm. somebody who's, who's trying to, you know, be a ball player. Um, but hopefully, you know, we, we can help them and, and, right. and keep them right. out of trouble and help them uh, continue to entertain and have a career. Would you say, uh, this is for just like musicians who might be watching, who 
you want either want to try to avoid those kinds of things, uh, things that are avoidable. Um, I would I would imagine that you would endorse the idea of you know when you're practicing, don't overdo it. Give your time. Give your, give yourself some relaxation time, or you know take a break. And also one thing I've learned personally is just whether I'm practicing or playing, performing, uh, always try to be as relaxed as possible. Absolutely. And um, I think, and I know speaking for myself, I'll get caught up in practicing, and I don't want to stop. Right. I just want to go, 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 go. And, and then, you know, I can push myself to the point to where I'm probably not helping myself, mm -hmm. maybe causing some damage, you know. Uh, so it's, it's hard to disengage and say, okay, time to rest, mm -hmm. you know, take a break. Um, and um, so overuse injuries are, are, are a big deal, you know. They lead to all kind of problems. You know, it's funny. Uh, I remember I was working towards a master's degree at a school that um, very well-known um, jazz school, and lots and lots of students, and very competitive environment. <laughs> I just remember the first semester I was there, I'd be walking on campus around the, the music area, mm -hmm. and I would just see a lot of people like in slings and bandages and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> what is this, like a mash unit or something? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> they have a fight club on Thursday nights. So. That's what it yeah, was. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just, you know, people just practicing too much. Yeah, too much, yeah. Get caught in the enthusiasm and the excitement of what they're doing and uh, it's easy to do right yeah and and in common mm -hmm. well um, aside from you know that that avenue I mean just in terms of one thing I've become really interested in especially working here at the Arts Council more recently is you know um, how the arts and not just music all the arts um, can have an impact on people's health, whether they're actually, you know, an artist themselves or just the layperson who is fond of the arts or exposes himself to it. One thing that kind of got me on this track is a previous podcast I did with a, a very dear friend who's a wonderful uh, classical pianist, Miss um, Jan Grimes. Uh, she has been dealing with Parkinson's for, I guess, going on 19 years. And uh, having gotten to know her so well over the years, uh, She's told me on so many occasions that, you know, because she, she's very high functioning, very high functioning, yeah. had so many years with Parkinson's. Yeah. And she attributes it so much to um, practicing every day, not just music. All, I mean, she's very, still plays very much, but also does poetry, is very active in creative things. Right. And right. What, what is your take on that or your thoughts on that or, you know? Well, I think there's no question that music is therapeutic in all kinds of different ways. And, um, you know, the, the thing that just pops in my head is quality of life. You know, it, it aids in uh, enabling people to feel uh, good about, their, about life. Yeah. And, um, and that, uh, that helps a lot of things. You know, uh, we know that uh, depression is disabling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the opposite of that, feeling good, uh, feeling like life is okay, is, is empowering. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's actually, um, it, it's healthy. Right. And, and uh, you know, uh, from time to time, I've played music for the patients at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times there might be a little old lady sitting there in a wheelchair and... Uh, Maybe I play a song or something that maybe she knew the song or maybe maybe it brought back something in her mind. And maybe she hadn't said two words the whole time she was there. And then all of a sudden she's smiling mm -hmm. and everything's different after that. For the next week or two, she's more engaged in in uh, her rehabilitation. Right. And um, so uh, so, I, you know, there's probably scientific evidence to prove these things. But I can tell you about anecdotal things that right. I've experienced. So, uh, you know, based on that, I think it's very powerful and very, very good, uh, not only for individuals, but for our society. Absolutely. You know, yeah. we need more music. we got a lot of problems in our society, <laughs> you know, and uh, music brings people together. Yeah. It gives people a sense of joy, and, um, and it's just, uh, 
it's there, I think, for a reason, and we need to we need to take advantage of it and 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 you know heal our our society with music. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember talking to students in the past about uh, one aspect of being a musician uh, is performing in a lot of cases and. Uh, in, in, in parlaying what people had told me just being a performer over the years of, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, and I'm sure you have too, like, oh yeah, you know, the, I really enjoyed the show, and you know, the music sounded great, but I really just, what what I really enjoyed was just seeing y'all happy on the stage. Oh, like, I've heard I, that like, a million times. Like it made me so happy to see y'all yeah. so happy. Sure, yeah. sure. There's something <laughs> about watching people enjoy themselves right. in an activity like that that just draws people in yeah yeah so uh yeah well chris i want to thank you so much for uh agreeing to do this oh and being it's my a pleasure guest. thanks for having me um i'm not gonna let you leave until we play another we're not gonna i'm not gonna let you leave without playing another song okay so All right. and a tune that popped up in our previous conversation was another tune that you had written yes which i i've always uh, i just dig the lyrics of this song and I just think it's funny and it's great. It's it's kind of a joke, you know. It's it's a fun little tune, and uh, I wrote it with Ed Perkins in mind, and you and Ed recorded it, and of course it was yeah. a huge hit, and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> it's how I bought my you know three million dollar home. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> in another life. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, so, what is the name of this song? It's called Easy Credit Lovin'. Give me a tempo. Okay. We, what do we say? F. Yeah. Okay. Coming down from the five. Yeah. Two, three. <laughs> Spends my money all over town My baby's too expensive Spends my money all over town And what it costs me to get a little loving Is getting downright a dead level wrong credit loving good love for no one and now I need some easy credit loving good love for no one and now love for low lump monthly payments so I can afford to keep some around if I own the whole wide world And everything that's in it I know for sure My baby could find some kind of way to spend it Easy credit loving Good love for low money down payments so I can afford to keep some around Yes, 
Guess the average man's got trouble. Cost of love's getting way too high. You gotta work nine to five to make a dollar. But it's gonna cost you ten to get satisfied. Council of the Greater Baton Rouge would like to acknowledge our generous sponsors, the Shell Corporation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, and the City of Baton Rouge. <laughs>